on to monitor uh, and combat anti-Semitism. Uh, Hood has also served uh, uh, at the U.S. embassies in uh, Paris, Qatar, Bahrain, and Kuwait. His this domestic assignment in Washington, D.C. included a two-year detail to the White House as the vice president's uh, Middle East advisor and various positions at the State Department working on Middle East and related issues. Hood previously worked for the United Nations for five years in East Timor and in New York as well as in private sector. He earned his ABA and MA from Brown and Columbia, respectively. Welcome uh, uh, with us, uh, Mr. Hood. Uh, our second panelist is Oriane Marie Kruger. She is the director of the European Affairs at Combat Antisemitism Movement. Prior to joining the movement, Oriane worked in the office of the Special Representative for the Holocaust Remembrance and the Fight Against Antisemitism at the German Federal Foreign Office. Her research is focused primarily on anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Uh, she is originally from Germany, studied both in Berlin, uh, Germany, and in Tel Aviv, Israel. Oriana received her master's degree in interdisciplinary research on anti-Semitism and also holds a bachelor's degree in political science. Welcome with us, Oriana. Our third uh, uh, speaker, Mitchell S uh, S uh, Silber. He is the executive director of the Community Security Initiative uh, to safeguard the Jewish community in the greater New, New York City. He is also a visiting lecturer at Columbia University uh, School of International and Public Affairs, where he teaches about terrorism and many more important uh, elements in the bio of uh, Mitch. Welcome, everybody. And our uh, event today is focused on, as I mentioned, the uh, unprecedented surge of anti-Semitism in Europe and the United States. Uh, uh, authorities and civil societies across multiple countries uh, have documented a significant uh, uh, increase in anti-Semitism uh, incidents. But this time, it's not just the rhetoric uh, uh, incidents, it's also physical threats. And this, uh, uh, prov uh, this uh, brings us to very critical questions, which is why we have very important and distinguished uh, guests uh, to speak about this issue. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Hood. Good morning, everyone. Delighted to participate in this virtual webinar. And thank you to Omar Mohammed and his colleague at GWU's program on extremism for organizing this very timely discussion and for including the Office of the Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. My name is Ludo Hood. I'm a career US diplomat, uh, currently serving as the senior advisor to the Special Envoy, Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, whose reputation as one of the world's leading scholars of the Holocaust and contemporary anti-Semitism is, I'm sure, known to many of you. Alarm bells are ringing throughout Europe and North America. Hamas's horrific massacre of Israeli civilians on October 7th, within hours, unleashed a shocking wave of support for Hamas's mass murder and a tidal wave of anti-Semitic rhetoric and incidents. This has not only continued over the past five or six weeks, but has snowballed while the Israel-Hamas conflict continues, heartbreaking civilian casualties mount and Middle East tensions fester. I don't think I need to repeat for an audience like this, the data compiled by groups like the ADL and by law enforcement in countries like Germany and the UK, suffice to say, in some West European countries, there were more anti-Semitic incidents in the weeks following October 7th than in all of 2022. And beyond the data, Jewish communities in Europe and elsewhere are concerned and they are scared. Families think twice about sending their kids to schools and they think twice about leaving their homes when some large demonstrations include calls for the destruction of Israel and all too often anti-Semitic slogans. While my office does not cover domestic issues, anti-Semitism is of course a cross-cutting global issue that has overlap between domestic and foreign policy concerns. ADL, the Combating Anti-Semitism Movement and other groups have documented the spike in anti-Semitic incidents here in America 
which has received significant media coverage and resulted in statements and announcements by President Biden and his administration. As many of you know, the current surge in anti-Semitism in Europe comes on the heels of what has been a 20 to 25 year steady increase in anti-Semitic rhetoric and incidents in Europe, including in some segments of some societies, the growing normalization of anti-Semitic discourse. Despite efforts by some governments and many civil society groups to counter this. European governments have since the 1990s responded to this rise with a number of initiatives, including one, an inclusive effort to produce a working definition of anti-Semitism, which ultimately led to the IRA working definition, a non-binding tool issued under the auspices of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA. Two, the appointment of national coordinators or special envoys to combat anti-Semitism by a growing number of European governments, as well as the European Commission's 2015 appointment of Katharina von Schnurbein of Germany as the EU coordinator for combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. Three, the 2021 launch of an EU-wide strategy on combating anti-Semitism and the subsequent issuance by a growing number of European governments of national strategies. And four, most visibly, steps by some governments to safeguard Jewish sites and communities including the deployment of police and even soldiers outside of synagogues and other sites. And as an aside, sadly, police presence outside US synagogues has become the norm in recent years too. I mention these efforts by European governments because we at the State Department in the Office of the Special Envoy focus much of our efforts on diplomatic engagement with European governments on these lines of effort as well as with subnational actors and, of course, civil society. And we work diligently to both share and receive best practices and lessons learned with and from our European governmental counterparts. Ambassador, Liptat, Ambassador Lipstadt and other team members attend regular gatherings of the European coordinators and envoys. And in the past couple of years, these gatherings have benefited from the presence of senior envoys from the UN and from the Organization of American States. We're a small team in the Office of the Special Envoy, so we rely heavily on the work of US embassies and consulates throughout Europe, not to mention embassy teams elsewhere around the world, be it Chile, South Africa, Tunisia, or Australia. And we coordinate very closely with the regional bureaus here at the State Department including, for example, comparing notes on how to convey messages of concern and calls for action. Sometimes public condemnation, condemnation is warranted. Other times, hard-nosed private diplomacy can be more effective. We also work closely with the Office of International Religious Freedom here at the state, which is led by Ambassador Rashad Hussein, as well as with other special envoys working on human rights related issues. Ambassador Hussein and Ambassador Lipstadt, for example, have repeatedly teamed up to underscore the imperative of building alliances when combating hate. For example, Ambassador Hussein and Ambassador Lipstadt have traveled to Auschwitz and to Srebrenica together in the past few months. I'd also like to highlight the work of our Office of the Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, which works to provide a, me a measure of justice to Holocaust survivors and their heirs. The work of my colleagues in this office brings me to another conflict. No, not in the Middle East, but the war that was on everyone's minds until October 6th, Ukraine, Russia. The relevance of the Holocaust to our foreign policy has become even more evident with the intensive efforts by the Kremlin to exploit the suffering of the Holocaust and World War II to justify its own aggression against and atrocities in Ukraine by asserting without a shred of evidence that its unprovoked war against Ukraine is a battle against Nazis, Russia attempts cynically to invoke its historic role in combating Nazi Germany to generate support at home for its illegal and indefensible war against Ukraine. 
I shall conclude with a few quick remarks about some actions underway here in the US. In May of this year, my colleague Ambassador Lipstadt joined President Biden and other senior administration officials to issue the US's first ever national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, which includes concrete action items for every, almost every federal department and agency. And I should quickly note here that the White House is currently working on a national strategy to counter Islamophobia. Our colleague Ambassador Hussein is closely involved in this. In light of recent events at a number of US universities, the Departments of Homeland Security and Justice are taking steps to ensure that campus law enforcement and administrators are working more closely with state and local law enforcement, while the Department of Education is making it easier for students and others who experience anti-Semitism and other forms of hate to file a complaint under Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And senior Biden administration officials meet regularly with Jewish leaders and other stakeholders to discuss anti-Semitism, whether on campuses or on the streets of our cities, and on how we can bring people, communities, and faiths together to overcome misunderstanding and fight hatred and bigotry. Now, I'll turn the floor over to some real experts. I look forward to the questions after the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, uh, I think now we, uh, since we also heard from you, uh, Ludwig, uh, uh, about Europe, we turn to uh, Oriana uh, to tell us more about Europe. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to the GW Program on Extremism for organizing this important discussion and also for including the Combat Antisemitism Movement here in this discussion. My name is Oriana Marie Kruger. As Director of European Affairs, I would like to focus on the surge of antisemitism in Europe. Um, in general, I would like to say that Europe is a continent, so um, the surge of antisemitism, we can see it in every country, but it's different in every country. Um, so as I said already, many Jews in Europe do not longer feel safe. Most of the European leaders have condemned the attacks of the Hamas terrorist group, but anti-Semitic incidents have increased. Um, just as an example, in multiple countries, doors were marked with the Star of David. There are mass protests against Israel everywhere. Jews are insulted online and receive death threats. And universities are also not a safe space for Jewish students anymore. Um, there's a feeling of helplessness that has not been experienced before. Um, and there was not seen such an increase in antisemitism since the Holocaust. To many Jews, this feels like the beginning of the horrors of their grandparents they experienced during the Holocaust. And what we can really see again is that antisemitism is a binding element between the far right, the far left, and Islamist ideology while we should not ignore the so-called center. So we also see anti-Semitism uh, among liberals and conservatives. In each European country, it's different. For example, in the UK, we see a lot of left-wing anti-Semitism with mass demonstrations against Israel. While in Italy, for example, the numbers of the anti-Semitic incidents have doubled, but the anti-Semitism is coming from the center, not from Islamist or leftist groups. The European Commission released a statement condemning the surge of anti-Semitism in Europe. Um, I quote, in these difficult times, the EU stands by its Jewish communities. We condemn these acts in the strongest possible terms. They go against everything that Europe stands for, against our core values and our way of life. Nevertheless, students all over the European Union um, feel targeted by fellow students, professors, and academic authorities on campus, being told that the Hamas massacre was justified. Um, to really not speak about Europe in general, but to give an insight on the different countries, I would like to speak about the different countries with the majority of the Jewish community in Europe. And I'm gonna start with Germany. Um, I think the pictures, went all over the internet when in Berlin on October 7, the pro-Palestinian network Samidun handed out baklava in celebration of the attacks of the Hamas um, terrorist organization. 
in response to that, the uh, there was an official ban on of, on activities issued by the government. But we could really see in the first 10 days only after the Hamas terrorist attacks that more than 240% of anti-Semitic incidents were reported more than last year. 90% of them were related to the state of Israel. Um, only in Berlin, since October 7, 116 demonstrations took place. And we could really see also synagogues being attacked. For example, a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a synagogue in Berlin. Last weekend in Erfurt, notes were set on fire in front of the new synagogue. Um, and on those notes, people had expressed their solidarity and those were set on fire in front of the synagogue. Um, houses are being marked with the Star of David in all over Germany. And in Essen, I think also those pictures went uh, all over the world <clears throat> where 3000 protesters gathered to participate in a demonstration that was organized by the group Generation Islam, where black and white ISIS flags were raised. The, and uh, it was called for the destruction of the state of Israel. As a reaction last weekend, 4,000 people demonstrated it in solidarity with the Jewish community and against anti-Semitism. Uh, in France, the, there's the biggest Jewish community in Europe, but also the biggest Muslim community. Um, around 1,200 anti-Semitic acts were reported in recent weeks, and more than 500 people have been arrested in connection with those uh, um, anti-Semitic attacks. More than 200 stars of David were sprayed on the walls of houses in the suburb of Paris, but I would like to also um, emphasize another, um, another, another layer of this conflict because um, the police caught people who were spraying those stars of David on houses who said that they were paid by and also engaged by Russians. So the Secret Service now assumes that um, this was a destabilization attempt of Russian origin to turn the communities of French Jews and Muslims against each other. Um, we could also see a lot of solidarity in France with <clears throat> two days ago, hundreds of thousands of people showing their solidarity in a large cross party march against anti-Semitism. In Paris alone, 105,000 people took part as well as tens of thousands of more in smaller cities. The president Macron did not take part in the demonstration as well as the leader of the left wing party while the leader of the extreme right-wing party, Marine Le Pen, she took part, which was discussed very controversial because she once described the Holocaust as detail in history and was convicted in court for making anti-Semitic statements. Um, also in France, the situation for Jewish students is problematic. Um, the president of the Jewish students of France said, if you want to demonstrate your support for Israel at university today, or simply the fact that you're Jewish, you are immediately threatened, insulted as dirty Zionist. That is the reality. In the UK, anti-Semitism rose by 512% since October 7. And the number went from 183 incidents during the same time last year to 1,124 incidents now. Those numbers are from the Community and Security Trust. Um, the London police has different numbers, um, especially London is seeing an enormous rise of anti-Semitism. And the London poni police uh, recorded 1,353 incidents in the city, only from October 1 to October 18, compared to 218 at the same time last year. So we have 1,000. 353 incidents compared to 218 in 18 days. Um, I think another example for the anti-Semitism that Jews all over Europe face is also Holocaust survivors being attacked. Um, one example is Lily Eber. She's 99 years old, living in the UK. Holocaust survivor has a TikTok account with 2.1 million followers, which educates people about the Holocaust. And she receives around 1,000 anti-Semitic messages every day. 
Um, the last country I would like to focus on are the Netherlands, because the number of incidents since the violence started in Israel is now 818% higher than the monthly average of the past three years. And even though the increase of the numbers was seen also during previous conflicts, it has never been as significant as now. Um, you probably also have all seen the pictures of the climate protection rally that was also captured by anti-Zionists and even Greta Thunberg uh, chanting no climate justice in occupied land. Um, I think the situation all over Europe shows that we cannot look at anti-Semitism and ignore anti-Zionism. Um, the rise of anti-Semitism on the left and in academic spaces needs to really worry us. And it's more important than ever to criticize blind spots of anti-Semitism in theories that are taught in universities, such as post-colonial theory. Jews are scared to wear kippah or their Star of David necklaces in Europe. Um, and this is a situation that we're in right now. Thank you very much. Very concerning, uh, Oriana. Thank you so much for all this information. Um, as you hear the Mitch from both Oriana and uh, uh, Ludwig, uh, it has become very concerning that Jewish communities are once again feeling unsafe in Europe and in the United States. Uh, many, many, uh, many incidents being recorded every day about physical threats. It's no more just rhetoric or discourse online. They, they are physical threats and many attacks happened already. Uh, uh, I, I leave it to uh, your remarks, uh, Mitch, to tell us more about the security measures. Thank you, Omar, and uh, thank you, Oriana and Ludwig, for, for giving the uh, global and European perspective. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the United States and New York in particular, and what we're seeing on the ground here. Uh, by the way, I was in Israel on October 7th that morning, 20 miles north of Gaza, with two dozen senior law enforcement officials from New York. Uh, we we're about to begin a program with the Israeli government reviewing anti-Semitism and combating terrorism when the war broke out. And uh, we were in the shelters probably about 20 times that morning due to the air raid sirens and subsequently got out via Dubai, thanks to the Abraham Accords um, with the uh, entire engagement. Um, but just a little background, because I'm coming at this from a slightly unconventional perspective. In New York, we've set up a security program uh, since 2020 to protect the Jewish community. And in New York, we have a Jewish community of about 1.5 million people, uh, and, and they have about 2,400 institutions, schools, JCCs, um, synagogues, museums, camps, so on and so forth. And this was a program that was created in the wake of the horrific terrorist attacks at the Tree of Life in 2018 in Poway, California, uh, in Munsee, New York, as well as Jersey City, that saw 15 Jews killed in the United States over the course of 14 months uh, for no other reason than they were Jewish. Uh, so this was pre-October 7th. We have a team of regional security directors who are out in the field working with every synagogue, school, JCC, camp, and museum to improve their physical security, to liaise with law enforcement, um, and to provide training, active shooter training. We also have three intelligence analysts who spend their time in the deep and the dark web looking for hostile threats against the Jewish community. And from time to time, we pass that to law enforcement, uh, like last November, where we thwarted a plot against a synagogue on the Upper West Side by two individuals who had a Glock, uh, automatic weapon, uh, ammunition, a hunting knife, and a Nazi swastika armband. Um, but since October 7th, uh, we sort of went from uh, out of the frying pan and into the fire back here in New York. Uh, just to put an explanation point on it in New York, anti-Semitism, uh, harassment, vandalism, and assaults is up 214%. October 2023 over 2022. Uh, those aren't quite the same dramatic numbers that you heard about from Oriana in London and Paris uh, and on the continent. But nevertheless, we were tracking lower uh, for 2023 until the war broke out. And now we've really had this explosion um, of incidents here in, in New York City. Um, you know, frankly, there have been a number of assaults 
but it hasn't been quite as bad as 2021, when was the last time Israel and Hamas uh, went to war. Um, so, you know, in talking about um, what, what's going on here in New York City, besides talking about what's going on, on the ground, it's also worthwhile talking about what's going on online. Right. So our team of intelligence analysts are using some uh, web scraping tools powered by artificial intelligence to look at postings uh, in the sewers of the deep and the dark web on Gab, on 4chan, Telegram, all the places that you, you might expect it. And, you know, since the war began, they've looked at more than 150,000 postings. Uh, postings that were caught because of the terminology that the posters use on these different social media websites. And they've had to review them and then make the determination which needed to be passed to law enforcement. That's five times our normal uh, rate over that time period of postings that we'd be looking at. And we've probably passed about 15 plus threatening posts that we believe could actually turn to violent action to some of our law enforcement partners. And we're very closely working with the NYPD, local law enforcement in the New York area, as well as the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. And historically, over the last few years, we've probably been responsible for the arrest of more than a half dozen people who potentially were about to commit a terrorist act. Um, Two weekends ago, we were involved and we talked a little about Ludwig talked about campus situation. And unfortunately, we were made aware of a threat to shoot up a Jewish dining hall at Cornell University. And we passed that along to uh, Cornell local police, to the New York State Police. Unfortunately, they were able to not only protect that uh, Jewish dining hall, but in record time, in 48 hours, uh, have that individual, unfortunately, a, a student uh, arrested for making these threats uh, against fellow students. And, you know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. The context was two and a half weeks earlier, a professor at Cornell had remarked publicly how excited and exhilarated he was about the horrific Hamas attacks into Israel on October 7th. A week later, there was graffiti scrawled into the Cornell campus, um, you know, major campus walks. And this unfortunate threat against a Jewish student or Jewish student dining hall was sort of the uh, end point of that. Um, but to talk about, you know, since we cover a variety of different Hillels uh, in the greater New York area and work with the Jewish students there, you know, we've had a Jewish student attacked down at NYU University for wearing an Israeli flag. Up at Columbia University, a student attacked with a stick. Uh, and these are just some of the physical world uh, events that, that have been going on. What we've also seen in New York and frankly nationwide is this proliferation of protests. Uh, you know, they're not notionally pro-Palestinian, but if I'm really calling it what they are, they're actually pro-Hamas demonstrations. If you look at the terminology, if you look at, you know, from the river to the to the sea terminology, um, these aren't protests calling for a two-state solution. These are protests, you know, calling for the elimination of Israel as a Jewish state. Um, some of these protests have bordered on getting out of control in New York City. Uh, last Friday in the evening, one of these uh, demonstrations that started at Columbus Circle, if you know New York City well, ended up at Grand Central, and the MTA police literally had to barricade the uh, Grand Central station closed because the Friday before, um, a flash mob had taken over Grand Central station. Obviously, you know, we're heading into the busiest uh, you know, weeks and days of the year for travel coming into Thanksgiving. And I can tell you that in New York, tensions are high. Um, just to wrap up in terms of where do we see the threat here in New York and as a proxy for the United States, the feeling among the Jewish community here on the ground is, reminds me of September 12th, 2001. The anxiety level is that high. People are afraid to go out, Afraid to go to synagogue, school. You heard some of uh, you know my co-panelists discuss that. 
But that's not really where we are. You know, we're not in a situation after 9-11 where we had Al-Qaeda, an organization that an external operations arm that could send operatives to the United States and had both the capability and intention to do that. It's not the same situation that we dealt with with ISIS not so long ago that also had an external operations arm and more so sent operatives to Europe than North America, but nevertheless had that capability. Uh, part of my background is at NYPD, and we had investigations while I was there looking into Hamas. And you know our understanding is that Hamas does not have this external um, operations capability, nor do they have the intent to, the, to attack the United States for fear they would bring the full power of the United States against them. So rather, the, the threat looks more like Hamas-inspired people who are online in their basement, ingesting all of this hate and vitriol, people deciding that protests aren't going to change the political situation and deciding that they want to just do something for the cause. And unfortunately, as we all know, to get a firearm in the United States is not a particularly high threshold. What we're also seeing online is the shared struggle that far-right extremists view that their struggle is in line uh, with a uh, pro-Hamas type struggle. And these are two types of ideological groups that would normally be at each other's throats. So the lone actor with a firearm is probably the main threat that we're looking at here in New York and probably the United States writ large. Thankfully, that hasn't come to pass yet, um, but obviously more, more low end uh, violence, physical assaults, uh, you know, hate crimes, and terrorism are close cousins. So the fact that we've seen this, uh, you know, grand expansion of hate crimes in New York and the U.S. writ large uh, is not a particularly good indicator for where we'll go in the next few weeks. But let me stop there so we can move on to the next phase of our discussion. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, I think I would like to start with some questions now. But uh, let me start with with Ludwig. You mentioned the. Uh, uh, very important uh, initiatives, but if I talk about uh, the initiative to to work on the definition and to ask about this current uh, rise in anti-Semitism, specifically a post-Hamas attack, how is it compared to the historical trend of anti-Semitism in Europe, and what is the source of this rise? How how did it happen? Why 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 it has become so normal to commit anti-Semitic uh, discourse. Thank you, Omar. And uh, Ariana and Mitch, great to hear from you both. I learned a lot today. Um, I have a feeling that Ariana will probably be better placed to answer your specific question, Omar. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, whenever there's a conflict in the so-called Holy Land, there does tend to be a spike in religious tensions around the world, specifically um, a sense of uh, anger. And I think as other speakers have uh, talked about, um, some sense of uh, bitterness and even uh, conscious or unconscious bias comes into play as people react to events um, in the Middle East. Um, I think what was particularly shocking to see was that even on the late in the day on October 7th, um, when even the Israeli government had no idea about the scale of the attack um, on civilians throughout parts of southern Israel, we already saw protests um, ostensibly in support of the Palestinians in a number of cities in Europe and Australia. And many of those contained blatantly anti Semitic um, cries and slogans such as gas the Jews in Sydney, Australia, within hours of that attack. Um, as, as, as a few people have quipped to me, um, this is maybe the only time in history where an, an attack on a particular group of people led to um, a once in a generation spike of hate against that particular people. Um, and I think there, there, there are a number of historical, political and other reasons for that. Um, I think there are different contexts going on in um, English speaking countries of Europe and the North America versus countries on the continent. Um, different um, ideas have been part and parcel of university level education in recent years. Um, colleagues have, my fellow panelists have alluded to some of the de 
colonization narrative, um, uh, much of which I think we would argue is problematic in the context of uh, the state of Israel. Um, and some other factors have sort of fed into, um, I think, some of these um, emotions, some of these biases, um, and definitely, um, uh, you know, manifestations of Jew hatred um, seem to flow all too easily um, whenever there is this the, the, uh, uh, spikes in conflict in the Holy Land. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, we need more voices on both sides finding ways to create common ground and understanding, you know, to provide a fuller history of what's happened in those areas, um, both ancient times and particularly since 48. Um, but it, it's, it's a bit dispiriting right now. I think we can all agree how far apart so many people are on these issues. But the bottom line is blaming Jews writ large for what is happening in Gaza today is utterly unacceptable. And any kinds of intimidation or harassment attacks um, are anti-Semitic, are hateful, um, must stop. Thank you. Thank you, Ludwig. Um, Oriana, it's it's the same question to you because you mentioned also there are many actors in the uh, uh, rise of anti-Semitism in, in Europe. Uh, many players, many... Uh, but we also have seen that a classic uh, anti-Semitism is back. Uh, and not only this, uh, uh, based on the observation, this is happening also with a very young generation. The question always comes, how, how did they learn about this? Where did they learn about it from? Um, I think what we we have a big problem um, when it comes to uh, the the intergenerational trauma um, that is being um, passed through generations. Um, but we do not only have a problem with intergenerational trauma that is passed through generations of the um, immigrant community that we have in Europe, um, but we also have a problem when it comes to education. Um, when it comes to education, I can say that in Europe, the Holocaust is treated as a problem of the past and antisemitism is always connected to the Holocaust. So when we speak about antisemitism in Europe, we always connect it to the Holocaust and education as something that happened and is not a problem anymore. So when we speak about antisemitism in school, we should always mention that it's a problem that is still ongoing in the society. Um, and I think to be honest, to, to break the cycle of the, um, the what kids learn from their parents or also what they learn in the media is through education in school, but not only in school, but also in university. Thank you, Oriana. Um, Mitch, as you as you, you heard from our uh, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, security is always impacted with this rise of, of, of anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, while you also mentioned important initiatives to secure and safeguard the Jewish communities, uh, one might ask also uh, uh, the the current sense of security among the Jewish communities. When I speak to to to, to friends, they say we are no more safe, we are no more secure, uh, and rightly so because they have been attacked, whether online, whether physically. Uh, uh, how, how to deal with this loss of sense of security? Well, before we created the Community Security Initiative here in New York, frankly, I spent two years working for former Ambassador Ronald Lauder, head of the World Jewish Congress, looking at what the threat was in Europe, as well as what Jewish communities were doing to better protect themselves. So London, Paris, Vienna, Kiev, uh, Warsaw, Copenhagen, uh, so on and so forth. So actually much of what we've put in place here in New York is taking the best, the best practices from some of the groups in, in Europe, like the Community Security Trust in London, who's been doing this longer than almost anybody, like the SPCJ in, in, in France, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it's a difficult issue to handle because when you're dealing with physical security, uh, one can, and we're in the process of, quote unquote, hardening the target, making sure that every synagogue, JCC, um, school, camp, museum 
has um, you know uh, doors that are that are resistant, has blast mitigation film on their windows, has CCTV cameras, has uh, you know security guards. Uh, maybe not having the gendarmerie in front of it like in in Europe, but now having police. Uh, patrolling and, and making occasional stops in front of the location. But at the end of the day, um, the community has to leave that institution. They have to leave that school. They have to leave that synagogue and go into the streets. And I think that's where the insecurity is right now. Um, to be honest, I think that probably the insecurity is exceeding the threat. Um, but, you know, when you have these uh, assaults on the street, when you have these conflicts that are breaking out, um, you know, around the, the posters, the kidnap posters, um, and, you know, because things go viral so fast with social media, any type of rumor um, just uh, continues to, to keep the flame burning. You know, in New York, we've had threats uh, ranging from, oh, there are people checking nannies and asking if they're the baby in their baby carriage is Jewish. Uh, our Uber drivers are making uncomfortable statements to obviously Jewish female passengers. None of these rumors were true, but nevertheless, people changed their behaviors and were significantly concerned about it. And, you know, as the saying goes, a rumor travels halfway around the world before the truth can catch up to it. Um, so it's very tough to put these rumors to bed. So we're spending a lot of time on anxiety alleviation here in New York, communicating to the community, uh, making sure we have NYPD and FBI, so law enforcement, letting the community know what their view is of the threat to try and bring down those tensions. Um, but it's a real challenge because once you leave a Jewish institution, you are out there in public and uh, you know it, it's tougher to protect an individual. Thank you, Mitch. Um, Ludwig, uh, back to you. SEAS uh, uh, works uh, uh, extensively on combating anti-Semitism and has lots of uh, uh, collaboration with other European uh, nations. Uh, one question comes is, despite all these efforts, we still have a rise in anti-Semitism. What are the effective uh, uh, policies and strategies uh, uh, that are needed more than ever. Uh, it's also connected to uh, a very important question from the audience. There is a fear that, and we know that when there is a conflict somewhere, hate crimes rise. And so the, the, the anti-Semitism is rising now. But one has the fear that even if the escalation and the conflict will uh, uh, reach a lower level, there is a fear that this will be normalized, that anti-Semitism will continue and it will not, it's not just connected to a conflict. It has become uh, very normal. My boss, uh, Deborah Lipstadt, with her decades of experience, sometimes likes to say half jokingly, uh, we're in a growth industry. We have good job security. Um, I, I think that's a sad reality for anyone who's involved in combating anti-Semitism, probably other forms of religiously motivated hate. Um, anti-Semitism is a 2000 year old uh, problem. Um, and the, the history of the Jewish people sort of speaks for itself, um, you know, over those two millennium. Um, yes, I think it is. It's, it's, uh, it's a sobering statement of fact, Omar, that despite the um, superb efforts of the European Commission and a number of member states within the European Union with coordinators and national strategies, uh, with a working definition, um, with a lot of sincere political will from key um, leaders in Germany and elsewhere, that the problem continues to rise. Um, I, I think I speculate that part of the problem is that, you know, the, the, the nature of anti Semitism, it's, it's a unique form of hate. It, it comes from all points on the political spectrum. It comes from all other religions. Um, it's uh, it's both punching up and punching down. Some people look down on the Jews for different reasons. Um, other people uh, punch up and accuse them of having too much power. Um, you know the 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 contradictions there point out how irrational um, uh, you know the Jew hatred uh, largely is, frankly. Um, I think we have to sort of keep pursuing all the lines of effort that we've all talked about. 
for better or worse, crises like these um, accentuate the urgency and um, uh, force people to think about coalition building, to talk about um, concrete actions. You know, I mentioned some actions here in the US to do with campus anti-Semitism. Um, these are big steps forward uh, for the federal government to start taking specific actions and measures vis-a-vis -vis, um, Jew hatred on, on university campuses. And none of this was really in play until the last few weeks. But what has happened at, at many um, universities across the US has forced um, a reckoning, has forced um, um, the federal government to sort of take action in a, in a number of areas. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ludwig. Um, Oriana, back to you. Uh, it's it's important also that you mentioned uh, the the law enforcement have seen some incidents where they thought that this is uh, uh, an action to destabilize the the the, the city or the state. Uh, but beside the law enforcement, uh, 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 I believe that it also combating anti-Semitism also con constantly requires more education more learning about anti-Semitism in order to educate people. Are there any initiatives around Europe? Are there any efforts to also involve more communities in the education about anti-Semitism? Yes, there are a lot of different initiatives to fight against anti-Semitism on the national level, but also on the local level, um, led by civil society, um, one example that just popped into my mind is a joint Muslim and Jewish football club, for example, that there is in, in, in Germany. Um, there are a lot of civil society organizations that are organizing exchange programs with Israel, with the state of Israel to get to know people. Um, other initiatives such as Meet a Jew um, by uh, the German Zentralrat, the Central Council of Jews. Um, basically, it's someone from the Jewish community coming to a school because a lot of kids in Germany, for example, have never seen a Jew in person and are happy to be able to ask questions and to also um, rethink about stereotypes that they have been taught at home, maybe. So there are countless initiatives by civil society organizations to fight against anti-Semitism. Thank you, Oriana. Uh, Mitch, uh, uh, it's always important to talk about security uh, uh, while we discuss the discourse of anti-Semitism. Um, you, you, you have you have mentioned the the initiatives, and I want to go back to this. Uh, it's also the same of what I told Oriana. It requires collaboration with other communities. Are there any efforts to involve other communities in the? Uh, 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 to provide more security, to to create, to bring back the sense of security to the Jewish communities. Sure, that's a great question. You know, obviously, you know, although the Jewish community right now feels like we're at the center of the bullseye, um, you know, there have been other extremist attacks in the United States against other communities. We don't have to go too far back into the past in New York State to the horrific shooting against Black Americans at the top supermarket uh, in Buffalo, New York. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, the Jewish community has been on the, the leading edge of working on security issues, but we have uh, quarterly meetings, uh, multi-faith uh, multi-ethnic group meetings in New York where we try and share what we've learned about security to these other communities, uh, Muslim, Buddhist, Catholic, um, you know, you name it, uh, Asian Pacific Americans, to make sure that everyone knows what the resources are that are out there, how they can apply in some cases for federal grants that allow the uh, enhancement of security at a location, um, as well as best practices in terms of dealing with uh, law enforcement, um, as well as technology. So we're trying to share what we know with some of the other communities that depending on the time and place have also been uh, in the bullseye and hoping that you know they also can feel safer and that they'll be allies of ours um, in, in the future. Thank you, uh, Mitch. Um, Ludwig, uh, 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 while it's always important to have the community-led initiatives in order to bring back 
the security. I know that SEAS is involved in high level coordination, as I mentioned, with Europe, but also with others. And this type of anti-Semitism requires collaboration beyond just the European uh, spectrum and the United States. Is are there are there any efforts to include others in this in this collaboration? Omar, I'm very glad you raised um, that particular line of questioning because up until October 6th, arguably the single biggest push of our office was working um, in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, there have been a number of important uh, developments in the Middle East region going back three, four years that have made conversations about combating anti-Semitism, about Muslim-Jewish coexistence possible in a way they weren't possible um, just four or five short years ago. Um, so Ambassador Lipstadt and I have traveled to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Morocco, Tunisia, the list goes on. Um, it's been a, probably the single biggest focus of our international travel efforts up until October 6th. Um, obviously what has happened has, has, has been a, a rather um, dispiriting, uh, sort of necessitated a pause on some of what we're doing. Um, given the popular sentiment and emotions playing out right now. Um, but we have every intention of resuming um, the push that we had, uh, particularly with the likes of the Emiratis and the Saudis. Um, and uh, we, we, think, we think that there is, you know, despite what we are seeing playing out now in terms of um, uh, widespread popular anger, um, uh, resentment and so forth, that, that, that that down the road, when things subside in the in in, in the Holy Land, we're we're we're, we're confident that we we can continue having discussions not only with governments but with a growing number of civil society groups, who who quietly in recent years have wanted to, um, you know, talk about um, these issues, including the historical role of the Jewish people throughout um, the Arab lands, for example, the in, the necessity of um, having um, understanding. Uh, and acceptance between um, the, the peoples of the so-called book, the, the, the three Abrahamic faiths, if you will. Um, so yes, we, we, we are even now, um, I'm, I'm still you know, engaging some of these governments, um, at least dip diplomatically on, on how we can overcome some of the obvious divisions right now. Um, um, and we hope to be traveling in the region again, uh, hopefully in early 2024. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Ludwig. Um, Oriana, uh, uh, one of the questions from our audience is about the social media, which has become the main source of spreading anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, are, are there any measures being taken to limit this uh, anti-Semitism online? Yes, and I think this is actually one of the most important things we need to speak about, about social media, about fake news on social media, about pictures traveling faster than uh, it was mentioned already, uh, fake news traveling faster than the truth and the truth has a hard time to catch up. Um, and I think that's why the conversation about social media is more important than ever with all the fake news spreading. Um, there are, I know that there are laws um, that Meta, for example, implements to protect the Jewish community to fight against anti-Semitism. Um, and it really depends on the platform. So Meta has rules and um, TikTok has less rules. And um, I think it's really time that we as basically world community that is using all of social media is calling up on the social media platforms to really have rules when it comes to fake news, when it comes to hate speech on social media. Um, and I know that the European Union has specific laws that are limiting um, the social media platforms, um, but they have not been able to keep up to this amount of hate speech that we encounter now. So this is a very, very important discussion that we need to have as the whole world in the globalized world we're living in. Thank you, uh, Oriana. We are left with five minutes and I would like to take the opportunity for this uh, last question from my side. Um, I'll start with Mitch. Uh, based on your expertise, what are the uh, uh, effective recommendations to, to combat uh, anti-Semitism, but also 
what is required to go beyond just local community collaboration to make it a more global uh, efforts in terms of physical security, but also combating it uh, online? Sure. Well, I would say a couple of things. Number one, in terms of combating the, the physical aspects, the threat of anti-Semitism, uh, you know, our organization is based here in New York, but we very closely speak to um, partner organizations like ours in Los Angeles, in Cleveland, in Miami, in Boston, as well as the UK, Australia, South Africa, and you know, to some degree, we're all looking at uh, English language social media online, and you know, it's, it could be a situation where someone in London might find something, a posting about a threat in New York while New York is sleeping. And having these uh, open conduits for the exchange of information allows that to be passed uh, when there's a pressing threat. And you can imagine a similar type situation where the U.S. might catch something before Australia is awake, so on and so forth. So intelligence sharing partnerships among some of the, the Jewish security organizations. Um, on the online front, I think that's been one of the most frustrating because you know the social media companies to date uh, still are not taking down content with the speed that we needed to be taken down. Um, you know, if there was a copyright infringement video on YouTube, you can imagine it'd be taken down immediately. Um, but hostile anti-Semitic pro-Hamas rhetoric on YouTube, um, Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth, uh, it just, the process is too slow and you get the feeling that this is more nuisance for the social media companies uh, than something they wanna participate. And that's the and that's the surface web. You know, we're not even talking about the 4chan's, the telegrams, the gab of the world, which are the Wild West. Do anything that you want. And there's no regulatory entity that has oversight on that. So I'm unfortunately fairly pessimistic about the social media side of the equation that really seems to be uh, uncontrollable. Thank you, uh, Mitch. Um, Ludwig, uh, uh, you have covered many important uh, 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 issues, uh, but I would like to ask you about how do you see the future of combating anti-Semitism, uh, specifically on the level of effective implementation of the policies that have already been uh, created, whether by the United States and also by other European countries? Look, I think that... Um... There was for half a century after World War II and the Holocaust, um, little anti-Semitism per se. Um, and that may have been partly the sad fact that most of Europe's Jews were um, wiped out uh, back in the 30s and 40s. Um, the reality is in the last quarter century, we've seen a steady rise um, punctuated by these spikes um, for different reasons, sometimes conflict in the Middle East the rise over the last 20 plus years has seen European governments and the European Union um, showing signs of taking it very seriously, um, in addition to um, continued uh, sincere political will by key politicians in West Europe, for example. And I think these will continue. I think we'll see more European countries issue national strategies. We'll see more governments um, act like the German government has been with very clear eyed statements about what is really at stake here, um, including in the context of some of the uh, darker sides of the protests, for example. I think we will, um, you know, in the US, as I said, we're just a few short weeks into the rolling out of the first ever national strategy. So I think that, you know, institutions um, backed up by, you know, the very effective advocacy groups working on these issues um, are realize the scale and scope of the problem and are taking um, the steps and laying the foundations for, for future such steps, in addition to all of the amazing local level type activity that groups like Mitch's and others in US cities and some European cities are working on. Um, and finally, I think, um, you know, episodes like we've seen in the last month or so really reinforce the need to focus on the coalition building, the bridge building between faiths and communities. Um, and um, I can't comment on how that is faring in, in the European context. I think more work is, is, is needed here. 
Um, and I do have colleagues um, both at state and elsewhere who, who are working on that, including at the White House. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ludwig. Um, Oriana, uh, uh, what do you think the European nation should do more to help combating anti-Semitism? In, in one minute, if you don't mind. Um, I think uh, on multiple levels, more can be done. I think on the governmental level, there are a lot of laws on anti-Semitism in the Western European countries. I think the um, they're just not... Um, so so anti-Semitic incidents are being recorded, but they're not prosecuted enough, even though there are laws in European countries. Um, I think on the educational level, I mentioned already, can be done way more. Um, and the anti-Semitism should not be only a topic when we speak about the Holocaust. Um, and then we also have the level of non-governmental organizations that should also um, learn more about anti-Semitism. We should really connect the fight of racism and anti-Semitism that we don't have organizations that are fighting only against anti-Semitism and others that are only fighting against racism and separating this fight and building um, basically not enemies, but uh, are are uh, having contradicting um, requests. So I think I'm also going with um, you, Lodovic, that uh, we should build coalitions between different organizations to speak more with each other. And then the le last level I would like to mention is the faith level. I think faith communities should build interfaith bridges um, to also enable a dialogue to um, focus on peace building instead of hating each other. Oriana, thank you. Uh, Ludwig, uh, Mitch and Oriana, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, uh, I'm really glad we had this discussion. It's a very important discussion. Uh, next week, we will have uh, another event focused on the Middle East on the same day next week, same time, 10 uh, uh, a.m. Uh, many thanks again from the program on extremism, and I wish you a good day.